So you have the PPT, right, Michelle? I do. Yeah, so Michelle, you should just share your screen. Okay. At the start of the seminar. Start of the webinar. Yeah. So I can share it now. Yeah. Okay. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, we are already recording. Did you start the recording? Are you talking to me? Yes, I'm talking to you. You were supposed to do the recording, not me. No, You're no. The I, I know. <laughs> Or done. <laughs> I don't it's know. It's, it says it's recording. That's what. That's why I asked the question. Uh, right. Michelle, I, I just hit recording on mine. So why don't we oh. begin if we need to right now? Hey, Ike, Jay, Kamal, hey, welcome. welcome. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good, hey, guys. All right. Hello, everybody. Hey. Great background. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's our office <laughs> every day. <laughs> Up of the world. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Yes. All right, let's. Okay. So we're starting? Yes, we are. All right, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Vishal Arora. I'm the co-chair of the New York, uh, New York chapter of Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. I'm very excited for today's event. It is an event where, uh, which is really near and dear to my heart, how to grow your business with acquisitions. We have a wonderful chamber. Uh, we, we have a wonderful panel. Um, and before we go in, I would like to bring uh, on uh, Gary Pasricha, who's the founder of Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. Um, Gary, could you walk us through uh, what, what is your vision for Punjabi Chamber of Commerce and talk to us a little bit more about it for, for the new people who are joining for the first time today. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vishal. I want to welcome everyone to a wonderful uh, webinar that we're going to be having on roll-ups. So a little bit of background about Punjabi Chamber. We are a nonprofit, uh, which were formed in uh, 2017, and now we have 13 chapters. And our mission is to unite and enrich the global Indian Punjabi community. And we do that by creating a network um, of businesses and professionals that can help each other. So we encourage you guys to join Punjabi Chamber. It's, a, it's free, it's open to non-Punjabis as well, uh, no issues. And you can uh, get on our directory. And we're also doing a lot of wonderful things when it comes to mentoring. We're forming a, um, an investment group and we're doing a lot of other things. So we welcome you to today's webinar and uh, I'll hand it off uh, back to Vishal, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, line of sponsors who uh, have sponsored today's event, and I would like to actually recognize them first before we start with the event today. Uh, I would like to start by recognizing uh, Mina Chib from Mass Mutual. Uh, Mina, can you please uh, tell us about uh, yourself and your company? Sure. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. This is Meena Chib, and uh, I'm in the financial industry last 10 years. And uh, this is the real uh, nice working in the industry and helping community. And on the note of Mass Mutual is a 170 years old company, Fortune 100 company, which is ranked seventh in a, in a row amongst the most ethical companies in the world. It's a front, front runner, not only 
as the highest dividend paid company, but also in the range of products. We have been helping community, our, India, our own community and others who are um, by providing free life insurance to our uh, low income group. And uh, this is a great uh, support to the people, those who cannot afford to pay premiums, it is free for them. And a big thank you to the health workers who are helping in this pandemic by offering them free life insurance and Mass Mutual has allocated $3 billion towards that. It's a big thank you to them. So that's what we do and we help the community to plan their financial future and in any terms of uh, we can secure their future, if we can secure the family, that's what we do. And thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to speak up about ourselves and about my company and I'm so proud to be working at Mass Mutual. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, Meena. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much for sponsoring today's event. Next, we have Rajesh Grover from Aura Health Solutions. Rajesh, please tell us about yourself. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. Some of you already know me, but I will start by introducing myself. My name is Rajesh Grover, and I own a startup company called Aura Health Solutions based in Somerset, New Jersey. As the name itself says, we are a healthcare technology company focusing on new and advanced solutions for physicians and hospitals around the country. Currently, Aura is helping, Aura is focusing on Medicare-based chronic care management program, where we monitor patients that have chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, COPDs, and through our remote patient monitoring platform and innovative devices. By using our platform, we reduce hospital admissions, improve patients' health, and the physicians get reimbursed for these services. Under our unique model, for every 100 patients a physician enrolls, they make additional $100,000 per year. That's only for 100 patients. And some of these physicians have 500 to 1,000 Medicare patients. In coming weeks, we will be launching our telehealth platform with unique features, which will be a game changer for this industry. For more information, visit our website, aurahs.com. I thank you all for your time and special thanks to Punjabi Chamber for coordinating this event. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Vichal. Thank you, Rajesh. Really appreciate the sponsorship. Now we have Rohan Honda from New York Life. Rohan, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Rohan Honda. I'm an executive partner with the Queen General Office of New York Life. First of all, I want to thank uh, Gary Vishal for putting this all together. Thank you, everyone. And uh, proud to be a sponsor of this event and others that do come up. Uh, brief uh, background about what we do. Um, I'm a recruiter with New York Life. As an executive partner, my job is to recruit, train, and develop. New York Life is a career agency. We are the largest mutual life insurance company in America and we offer opportunities to individuals who are seeking alternative careers. As the platform, the business platform grows post uh, COVID, there are many, many opportunities that are available in the financial advisory platform where a growing number of people need financial advisors to guide them uh, through this uh, uncharted territory. So when this does happen, opportunities open up. There's a great pool available outside of talent. So if you know anybody who may be interested in joining New York Life, we'll be glad to offer. A little bit about the company. We are uh, well positioned right now with um, a humanitarian grounds. What we've done is we've acquired Cigna's group life and disability operation as of December. This is um, a merger and acquisition, which is um, uh, very, very hard to find in industries like ours. Uh, we'll be getting into a disability platform where we can offer disability insurance. And also Cigna and New York Life together formed an organization called Brave Apart for COVID, where the deceit money of $50 million, we were able to help hospital workers and volunteers who passed away taking care of COVID patients. There is benefit available both short-term and long-term for the families of these parish workers who can apply for these benefits. It will be my honor and pleasure to help anyone who may want to seek these benefits for any of their friends who may be affected. Thanks again for this platform. It's a pleasure and honor to be here as a sponsor. Take it over, Vishal. Pleasure to be here again. 
Thank you, Rohan. Once again, thank you very much for the sponsorship. Uh, we have another sponsor, Chetan Dogra from Dogra CPA. Um, Chetan, are you here? I don't think so. He's here. Thank you very much to uh, Dogra CPA for the sponsorship. Now I would like to uh, uh, bring upon Vijar Kohli, who's the moderator for today's uh, uh, great event. He put together the whole event uh, with the help of others in Punjabi Chamber. A uh, little bit about Vijar. Vijar is a partner and co-founder of Golden Door Asset Management, a Newark-based investment firm founded in 2013. He specializes in distressed opportunities and works closely with private equity and family offices. I personally know Vijar for a while and I learn every time we talk. Um, uh, he has something new to offer and new to uh, teach others. Thank you very much Vijar for uh, spearheading this and uh, I give it to you. Now, uh, please take it away. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Gary, and the sponsors for sponsoring the uh, Punjabi Chamber, taking care of the event. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about roll-ups, so growing your business through acquisition. Uh, three panelists are quite experienced in this, this, this area of financing, um, or growing your business through this area. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to choose an industry, the challenges they faced while uh, picking um, uh, the business problems, and then how they built their teams and where, where to go to raise capital. So quickly, we'll begin with an intro from uh, each of our panelists. Um, they'll talk about their backgrounds, and then we'll open up the, uh, the entire panel for a Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout the, the webinar, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Vishal and I will be monitoring the questions and have them answered by the panelists in an orderly fashion. And if you'd like to ask them um, directly, we'll open it up uh, and maybe in 20, 30 minutes. So let's start off with Kamal. Kamal, if you could just go into uh, how, you, how you came across your business 20 years ago, how you started it and where you are today, and then we'll pass it off to Ike and then Jay. Sure, thank you, Vijar, and thank you, uh, Punjabi Chamber of Commerce, Gary and the team for putting this together. Appreciate being called on this uh, webinar. Uh, just a quick background, I'm the CEO of Echo Group of Companies. Uh, we are a leading provider of contingent as well as managed services in the area of healthcare as well as pharmaceutical industry. Um, we have a pretty diverse platform where we work in four complementary segments, providing these uh, offerings to our customers, primarily in the nursing area, allied uh, life sciences slash information technology, and uh, recently, we added uh, physician staffing or locum staffing as we call it. Uh, my background, uh, I am an immigrant, uh, was born in New Delhi, came here early years, did my high school uh, in New Jersey. Uh, after high school, I went to Rutgers University, did my bachelor's in uh, biochem. And uh, just like any other immigrant, the Asian immigrant, uh, was pursuing medicine, but uh, saw a lot of opportunities back in the Y2K area in terms of technology. So I changed gears, went uh, to NJIT to do my master's, uh, further pursued my education in Columbia for my MBA. And uh, uh, going into the industry, we saw a massive opportunity in the technology side. So. Our company initially started with IT staffing, consulting work in the Y2K area, primarily for large hospital systems, nursing homes, and uh, the large farmers. As we grew out of the Y2K, we continued to look for opportunities and we saw uh, there is much broader service offerings that we can offer to our customers in the hospital space uh, than just IT. And that's where in 2001, we opened our first healthcare division or segment, which primarily catered to providing nurses uh, to these large hospital systems. As we continued our journey, we saw healthcare is not just nursing and uh, you can continue to expand. Again, being an entrepreneur, the biggest thing is how do you diversify yourself? How do you make yourself differentiate from your competition? And that's where we continue adding service lines into our business offering. We moved from nursing into allied services. And when we say allied, it's primarily therapy, uh, 
and associated services to therapy, which is PTOT, speech language pathology. And uh, as we continue to expand, we wanted to become a full service provider in the healthcare area. So we uh, continued to move from IT into the pharma space and also do clinical as well as scientific staffing, which are kind of niche uh, offerings in our industry. Uh, recently, uh, three years ago, we added another physician staffing firm to acquisition um, and started the physician staffing called Locum Tenant. Again, the journey, uh, we always believe a lot in the initial layers in terms of organic growth. And uh, that's what you are taught being an entrepreneur, you continue uh, growing through that. But uh, soon we realized that you know the market conditions, the outside factors which are beyond your control, uh, continue to put, pull you down as you're continuing to growing. So uh, that's where we went on the journey early, late 2000s in our first acquisition, uh, which gave us a taste of how to acquire a company, the challenges that entrepreneurs face in terms of financing some of these acquisitions, as well as the culture that you build and integration of these platforms. And in the last decade, we have done 10 acquisitions. And uh, I'm proud to say that all of these acquisitions have been uh, pretty successful and have continued to help us get to the levels where we want to reach. Currently, uh, Acor Group uh, stands in the top 20 healthcare slash, uh, slash uh, clinical scientific uh, staffing organization in US. And uh, we continue to expand on our role. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in detail as uh, the webinar progress, how we were able to get the financing, how we brought a PE group to help uh, facilitate some of the larger acquisition. And the journey hasn't stopped as of yet. We continue this was a big milestone for us. And we are now looking at doubling, tripling our company in the next uh, few years to come. Excellent. Yes, definitely. I think a lot of people will want to know about the private equity raise. I, if you could go into your background, how you also are a New Jersey native and where your, your history of roll-ups are in the, uh, in the technology space, please. Sure. Thanks, Vijar. And thanks, Kamal. That was very, uh, very interesting, your background. So hello to everybody in the Punjabi community. I'm a Delhi born and raised Siddharji who came, uh, went to Springdale's in Delhi, Delhi University, Sri Ram College of Commerce. And during my final year, I uh, migrated to the U.S. And like many Punjabis, ended up at my Masi's place. Masi, just like my mom, uh, gave me all the encouragement and love along with uh, her family, her son, who uh, I grew up looking up to as a older brother and a role model. So I had great fun. I was lucky to have a great support system in the U.S. It led to additional education while working, uh, and I ended up taking courses in finance and marketing at Rutgers, and very quickly got absorbed in the tech space. And by virtue of just tech being what tech is, it took me right into, you know, I got thrown right into fire uh, in projects that the companies were delivering into Wall Street and all sorts of different industries in the country. Um, after a couple of years of uh, putting time, energy, money, and grit, into following role models and opportunities. It led to deploying a number of trading floors, software, hardware for some of the biggest banks in the world. And then tech leads you to Silicon Valley. I ended up in Silicon Valley, which led to a management buyout of a company uh, by a few folks. I was one of them, the youngest one in a group of very good partners I had found and mentors. And it led to a decade full of acquisitions maybe close to about 40, 50 acquisitions, half a dozen and more roll-ups, uh, raising hundreds of millions of dollars in these acquisitions, uh, primarily uh, companies that were in the networking space and uh, dealing with data accuracy, data transmission, data security, and optimizing different industries. Uh, that's what technology does when you get into it. And that led to a uh, number of verticals within the net networking technology space uh, optimizing different industries, either media or, or other forms of tech or security or surveillance or financial markets or uh, film, uh, animation, and healthcare. Uh, so different verticals from, and these opportunities 
going through management buyout can probably tell you that you're dealing with an acquisition where you don't have the money and you have to find the money right off the bat to pay for yourself. <laughs> and so it leads to a different breed of skill sets that you are learning as you go and with mentors and friends that you have around you and partners. And it was a great decade of, you know, identifying an opportunity, a unique opportunity, uh, structuring the transaction, uh, and then due diligence in this transaction and financing the transaction, and then integrating the cultures, the human capital, making sure you're retaining what you really acquired. Did you acquire to build? Did you acquire to just rescue? Did you acquire to facilitate growth, not just short term, but maybe hopefully a sustainable business model that's for the future, building value? Because a number of folks can get, a, get indulged in these acquisitions where you know you can be just in for the fee, a short term gain, or a financing and a transaction that allows you to live and live a little longer rather than a sustainable business. So having gone through a number of these transactions, um, acquired a, a sense of what you're really getting in for, uh, what industry you're looking to do a roll up in, uh, what is the purpose of the roll up, uh, what is the short term threading the needle kind of an exercise you gotta go through, what you gotta be prepared with, having a team that's got a SWAT team I call it, which is you know, you've gotta have that team that's going to help above and beyond the daily activities of your business to be able to uh, have relentless energy, uh, be able to multiple task, and basically be unified in that objective of acquiring a business that's going to have a successful, sustainable yield to it. Um, I ended up uh, being part of the leadership team and CEO of companies uh, that had revenue streams of a couple hundred million dollars and more, market valuations of, you know, a few hundred million to half a billion and more and served as CEO for a bunch of them. Many of many of the roll-ups in the industry usually are failures. They don't necessarily survive long. Um, the only roll-ups that uh, make sense, and I've had a few failures, and the ones that had success had elements of everything I pointed out. Um, they were successful because there was a long-term plan from leadership in order to ensure, and they were vested to ensure that it's not just a short-term game or vanity play. Uh, you're dealing with people's lives, you're dealing with investors' lives, you're dealing with, depending on, you could say, a public transaction or a private transaction. Over the course of the last decade and more, um, most of the transactions I've been involved with have been non-public transactions. Public transactions were, there was a decade where they were really useful um, and uh, had legs to stand on. Public markets today have a lot of baggage attached to them as far as scrutiny and the ability to manipulate transactions from Wall Street to everything else. Um, so having gone through a ton of those experiences, um, I've, I've been lucky to venture into different industries from animation to media to human capital. And then human capital in particular found a, another uh, tactical approach towards uh, roll-ups. It doesn't necessarily have to be just a corporation. It could be roll up of talent itself. Um, so I was co-founder for a, a human capital company called Options Group on Wall Street. It's in the top three, four firms in the world where it basically has been globally retained by firms like Goldman Sachs and Fed Swiss and Barclays, a whole lot of different firms and spot of different companies that came out of them uh, as alternative investment funds, hedge funds, names that you may know of in the market like Fortress, Citadel, Cerberus and others. And these relations of long-standing relationships with these folks where we saw guys that manage money, the top 0.01% of the world uh, are managing money in different ways. Money doesn't sleep. They have to deploy that money to make a better yield. And what do they have to do about it? Not every time they want to trade on some opportunity or invest in some opportunity, they're going to go buy someone. They, they, and that's where the roll up of talent comes in. And talent is priceless. The war for talent is insane. You can, for, for example, uh, Goldman Sachs might be looking at a prop trading desk that's got an allocation of $5 billion that's giving them 60% return. And are they going to go build that from scratch or are they going to buy someone? And the same thing is being viewed by other competitors and peers like Morgan Stanley or others. And it's easier for them to attract talent, build talent, and acquire talent and a roll up of talent in a fashion that they can not necessarily just keep buying assets that might not stay with them. So retention of human capital, retention of IP above and beyond human capital of IP itself in tech 
or other industries that people are looking at plays a huge role. Um, I think that covers to the point where I can contribute towards wherever the questions might come from, from the community. As immigrants, we can see there's a, a lot of desire for all the intelligence that's in the Punjabi community uh, to basically leverage the community and skill sets and uh, come ahead. And this is a great forum that you guys have put together and honored to be part of it. And thank you for thinking of us or me. Thanks, Ike. Uh, next up, we'll have Jay. Jay, if you could go into your your background of going from Rutgers uh, to the West Coast, selling your startup, and getting into the venture capital industry, it'll be uh, it'll be great. Jay, yeah. unmute yourself, please. You're on mute. Great. I was going to say, since I and Kamal both began by talking about where they were born, I will do the same and I will one up them because I was born in Punjab, India, not New Delhi. So, you know, I just wanted to say that. Um, immigrated to the U.S. when I was four years old, New Jersey native, Rutgers, then Wharton MBA, West Coast for 10 years where I worked for several years at Microsoft in my dream job in tech. And then in 2006, I left and started my own startup, raised about 12 million in venture capital in Silicon Valley and sold that company in 2009. The company that acquired us, um, you know, during my earnout period, since we were the biggest acquisition they had done at that time, I became a central, you know, person in leading acquisitions going forward for that company. And in less than a year's time, we did over like, you know, between, you know, 70 and $80 million worth of acquisitions of digital companies uh, with a very efficient tax structure that we could go into detail over there. So from a purely conversational to the topic of today, there's three points of view I could bring. One is like how we acquired companies as a holding company uh, from a tax efficiency standpoint. After my earnout was done and I came back to the East Coast, I started doing angel investing. And then um, I got together with a former CEO of um, Virgin Mobile and the former CEO of Lego USA. And we started a perpetual you know, holding fund as you could call it. And we got some pretty significant LPs in there who were big family offices. And we basically started buying a large majority interest in early stage companies, 20, 30, 40%. And you know we've held a lot of those companies for a long time. We sold a couple of them recently, one to Nestle, uh, one to Rocket Internet, and you know potentially you know a couple more that will sell to big, well-known Fortune 50 brands. Um, so we've done you know so I could talk a little bit about like how do you develop a portfolio and a thesis around how we did our holdings and why we did them. Uh, but the third point also is um, I get to work with a lot of family offices in my in my career. Um, and I'm talking about family offices, some of the richest families in Asia, France, um, you know, Middle, uh, Middle East and stuff like that. And, you know, one of the things I got into detail with them is how they set up their internal family offices, how they set up their holding entities um, from a standpoint of like holding assets and what their goals were from either asset appreciation or cash. And, you know, there's a lot of things we can go into, whether it be the technical structure of how they did that and what's the right way to do the technical setup of your entity, and then also the thesis of how you want to, you know, you know, build and grow your entity through acquisition. And we can go into detail over there, but those are the most relevant. I was also co-chair of Governor Murphy's transition team on the technology and innovation side. And I've also done several um, talks along with Congressman Frank Pallone on tech and you know the challenges that tech faces and whatnot, especially in this world of big social with Facebook and everything. Excellent, excellent. So why don't we start off backwards uh, from the world of finance. One of the questions that came up was uh, acquisitions versus roll up. Someone's asking what the difference is. Jay, why don't you jump into, you know, e-commerce is obviously the biggest area of growth in, in 2020 given the pandemic. You know, can you ex describe what's happening in the market um, and then maybe what the difference between an acquisition and roll-up is from your, your side of working as an investor versus an operator? Yeah, so like, I mean, e-commerce, like the, the, you know, we were very worried about when, you know, the pandemic hit that a lot of our brands would get affected. The one thing that helped us, our thesis was always to invest in brands that we felt like were the future. So what's the next generation of healthy food delivery? What's the next generation of healthy vitamins? What's the next generation of healthy home workout equipment and home workout clothing? And our companies have done exceptionally well. I mean, they've grown much more than we've even projected before this entire thing happened. And the reason is because there's just more people online buying stuff. And, you know, online has, you know, the thing I tell everyone is that the digital world has grown by 10 years because people who are elders who would never used online are not buying their groceries online. So 
everything's accelerated. The, the market size of the online consumer has grown a lot. So there's a lot of interest in a lot of DTC companies. And, you know, a lot of the CEOs I talk to in direct consumer brands, you know, they're getting approached for acquisition very quickly from legacy brands. So, you know, a company like P&G, a company like, you know, like uh, Procter & Ga- Nestle, for example, or, you know, another big brand that's like, you know, or even Home Depot, a lot of them are approaching innovative companies saying that, you know what, this is a future and I'm willing to pay a premium now versus waiting two years and having to pay even a more premium because you might be even bigger by then and I can't internally innovate. So the way I look at it, you know, if you're an online direct to consumer, this is, you know, we've accelerated the growth by 10 years over here and you know acquisition you know like uh, it's kind of interesting like acquisition is more like hey i'm gonna buy this and like the way i look at it is like growing through acquisition is us buying the entire entity th- throughout i look at roll-ups as more like you know buying smaller entities or pieces of entities and owning a majority controlling interest in them but not buying the entire thing right and so if i look at that like a lot of family offices i work with they like to own the entire thing. Like they want to own the entire company. A lot of holding companies that are set up by other people, uh, especially multifamily offices, they might do something where it's like, hey, I don't need to own everything as an acquisition. I might do a roll up where I own 30, 40% of each one, but I have a board seat and I have controlling interest in some way. Right, excellent. So we'll come back to that, the difference between a hold co and an investment company um, when we talk about taxes. Kamal, let's come back to you and talk about um, building, uh, starting from scratch, building a business, which was sm- a small business, which is now sizable, and then finding a private equity firm to help you financing. So that growth, that organic to inorganic growth that takes place uh, in, in a roll up. Absolutely. So we have been, you know, starting as an entrepreneur from basically zero uh, to where we are. We kind of played both sides of the equation. We started our growth trajectory and our strategy was primarily doing acquisition so that we can really come to a size where PE firms will evaluate us as a platform. Um, once we engage with the PE, now our strategy is more of what you can call as a roll-up strategy, where the goal is primarily just keep acquiring at a lower multiple and the end objective is to sell at a higher multiple based on the sheer EBITDA growth which we are seeing. Uh, so going back on, you know, acquisition, the primary targets which we were defining, we had a multi-pronged approach in terms of acquisition when we were looking at. Uh, you know, we picked an industry, especially the healthcare staff aug- augmentation or contingent staffing industry, which is highly fragmented uh, because of the licensing which is required, state-to-state bureaucracy as well as policies that dictate that industry. And as a result, what we saw, if we wanted to really grow a uh, nationwide player, we really need to go out into j- different geographies. And that was one of our prong approaches in terms of looking at acquisition targets that will give us a play in different markets where we are not providing services currently. So we looked at markets which were really expanding, uh, you know, the Florida's of the world and all, all of the market where healthcare was really booming and we started targeting companies in those geographies to help us accelerate our growth. Uh, Another uh, thing which we looked in our strategy for acquisition was let's look at companies even if there are competitors in the existing markets where we have a play, how do we bring them on so that we become sizable or if their competitors are offering services which we don't currently offer to our clients so we can bring those service offering back to our existing clients and create synergies on the front end. Um, and during acquisitions, early days of acquisitions are, you know, we, we I read multiple books, multiple stories on why acquisitions fail. And the biggest key takeaway for us was most acquisitions fail because of over integration. And that's what we try to stay away with. People, whoever have built their companies, once you acquire, our goal was not to over-integrate, let the front office run as is, let their sales team, whatever culture they have built at the moment, let it run in that environment rather than bringing on your culture and trying to make changes too fast where people get threatened, your employees get threatened, and as a result, you lose players who are your ultimate performers. So we try to not over-integrate, let the companies have alone, 
and we try to look at where are the back end synergies that we can take advantage of, you know, whether it's accounting, whether it's IT, whether it's HR, because those are back office shared services that do not impact uh, the front end sales team or your business offerings as much. And that's where we cre started creating back office synergies to bring cost savings and uh, sheer play of uh, volume to the vendors which we were engaging in. And that has really helped all our acquisitions till today, very successful. We retain the management teams as much as we could uh, by management incentive shares in certain cases or, and as the con company continued to grow, we were able to bring them into different roles based on their experiences where they could add into the continuous growth of the team where we stand. You know, one thing uh, which I mentioned you know, acquisitions become successful based on the teams that you assemble. But again, when you are when you are an entrepreneur starting from scratch, you don't have the capability to put those teams together. Today, I can say we have a full deal team which is engaging, which is going out, looking at identifying targets for us. We have once it moves from that point, we have people uh, like KPMGs who will do our uh, due diligence, and then we have a full you know, the legal team which helps us close this deal. But in the initial days, the CEO or the owner or the entrepreneur is the one which acts as a due diligence guy, who acts as the deal closing guy, who is fishing for new opportunities. So you have to be mindful without impacting your current business line. How do you run and how do you make time in order to make sure you continue on this path? And as you continue to grow, you will start engaging certain people in your group who have the bandwidth so that they can help you take on some of these roles as you grow. And uh, two years, three years ago, actually, once we were at the size where we felt we are, we could be a platform to some of the private equity firms um, because it's a share EBITDA play where they don't want to look at companies below 10 million of EBITDA. Uh, once we crossed that threshold, we felt we really needed to do acquisitions which were much, much bigger. And uh, we went out in the market, we uh, spoke to almost 13 different PE firms, and uh, we had a very clear uh, strategy in terms of which PE do we want to engage. We wanted somebody who has experience in the healthcare area, we wanted somebody who are not operators and would let us run the organization with at least a sizable control so that we can con continue taking our vision forward. And uh, we found a partner which uh, out of Canada, which was very helpful to us. And they exactly fit into what we were looking at, the right PE form. And uh, just working with them, they pretty much, our one major objective was to have access to additional financing to make the bigger deals. Uh, and that's what they were able to provide to us in the last uh, two and a half years of our engagement with them, with them, we have done three deals, which are pretty much uh, three times the size of deals we have done in the last seven years. So it changes your trajectory in terms of how you're working, how your mindset is. And now I would say these deals which we are doing and the PE brings a lot of experience to us uh, where they are helping us maneuver the play of roll-ups rather than us just trying to do uh, acquisition to grow and how to create synergies in uh, terms of cost savings, how to really evaluate EBITDA of the organization, how will it continue to add. So that has been a tremendous help for us uh, engaging a PE partner uh, in the last couple of years. Got it. So could you talk about how you source deals uh, pre the private equity partnership and, and post, you know, how, how do you go about finding, you're essentially acquiring competitors, whether vertical or horizontal, so that conversation can be difficult. It can be challenging to find smaller businesses that are below that $10 million in EBITDA. How did you go about finding those deals? And then how did you finance them before raising capital internally? Sure. So uh, pre-PE form, our acquisitions, we used to go to a lot of industry events, uh, especially there are events where your competition is there and we started talking to and most of these events have sponsors or bankers who do small deals and we started talking to all these bankers telling them we are in the market looking at opportunities 
And pretty much uh, once we did our first deal, which was pretty small from where we look at today, it was just a million dollar EBITDA we acquired. But now when we look at it, we took that deal and we marketed the hell out of it in all of social media. We engaged uh, multiple uh, newspapers and did a full-fledged marketing of inquiries out in the market looking at the acquisition. And that brought a lot of investor bankers into play with us where uh, we started getting uh, at least deal sheets from multiple uh, groups that we were evaluating. But we were very strict in terms of, uh, and we are still very strict with the terms of acquisitions we do. If it doesn't fit in the box which we have created as our strategy, we try to shy away from it because there's no point of trying to fit something in just because the numbers look too good. And that's another reason why some of the acquisitions fail because you can't just take it as a pure number uh, game. You have to look at how the culture will evolve eventually, how will it fit into your overall organization and are they are the people running that groups, are they having the similar mindset what your organization has done over the years. And uh, coming back to financing these, you know, again, Starting small, you don't have a lot of financing options. You know, there are two easy options. Is either you put your own money or you are able to get line of credits to any institutions uh, that are out there, the banks that you deal with. The other type of financing which we leveraged after we ran out of a line of credits were asset-based lending, which is kind of a hybrid between line of credits and factoring but at a sizable weight where you can still have enough play with your margins and uh, continue making deals and it makes sense to run your business. Because a lot of companies I've seen have failed where they go the factoring route in order to grow fast, but if the margins within your industry cannot sustain those kind of interest rates, you are going to suffer uh, badly, especially when the market conditions uh, change as we are today in this kind of a pandemic. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Ike, there was a question that came up. If you could talk about one, categorizing acquisition targets, and then two, the role of an investment banker, since that's something you've done as well uh, post roll ups. Sure. Um, so I'll start backwards. Uh, identif- I can start either way. Mm-hmm. Acquisitions and identifying them. I mean, it depends on the industry you're in and what life cycle you're going through in your own business. So as Kamal, you know, pointed out, he was uh, he was the start. He, he started the business himself as an entrepreneur. Had to start from scratch. Didn't have the team, and slowly got to a point that he put together a team. He had to do everything himself. It goes back to what I was pointing out earlier. You got to be able to have yourself be the multiple tasker, and then others you add to yourself are similar or better than you. That's how you build a team. So identifying a business will depend upon which industry you're in, what life cycle you're going through. I, I hinted towards some of the comments I made earlier about, you know, are you going in for a roll up or an acquisition? An acquisition could be to build upon your current business, uh, organic products, the complementary products. A roll up could be beyond just an acquisition. It could be multiple acquisitions and it could be beyond your focus and complementary products and complementary revenue streams. Um, and so, I think I saw one of the chat questions coming out saying acquisition versus roll-up. So I wanted to attack that while I'm addressing this as well in the sense that acquisitions you can build with, that's great. Roll-ups end up being in a position where the whole idea is to create enterprise value, not just acquire a product or a business unit by itself. The bigger picture is creating enterprise value. Uh, How do you go identifying those? It also leads to how do you go source them? Identifying eventually leads to how do you source them? Uh, so once you know the industry, what life, life cycle you're going through, are you running a company already where your profits are gone, your margins are depleted, and your valuations are going down and down if you're already public? And if you're not, you're private, you're dealing with the same challenges without the stock value going down all day. Um, and so are you going to go rescue that enterprise value in the same core business? Are you going to go acquire inorganic uh, a growth via acquisitions that uh, will put you in a zone where you can use financial instruments like leverage finance to bring back, bring back enterprise value. Are you in a phase of a life cycle of the business where the products that you've been building, running, and selling are basically 
getting old and you need to transform the business into leapfrogging into what's the next wave of these products. Where in the life cycle of that operations are you uh, running the business will define what you really need to bring in. Uh, and then where do you source these from? It could end up being you know, a number of sources where we've been able to uh, leverage upon our peers in the market, having a friendly conversation of who's where in their lives. They're not just competition. They're, as uh, good competitors and fun, friendly game in the business, you can. Um, those are some of the best ways to see that might be a, a good opportunity to pick up something that you're already familiar with, a relationship you already have. How, Same would, you, to- how would you differentiate yourself in those conversations? Because there's a lot of that going on today. What would you say that you know make yourself look different? Sure. Um, so there's many different ways you can be unique and uh, differentiate yourself. Uh, a lot of that is happening today, like you said, rightfully. It comes down to the fundamentals of the business. It could be a business that's caught in a life cycle of some sort of harm or some sort of um, event such as COVID where clients have disappeared, products great. It's paused for, for revenues for now, or it's burning money because of debt coverage versus the ability to sustain themselves. So being familiar with those situations allow you to, perhaps if your fundamentals are better, put you in a zone where you can take advantage of these unique uh, scenarios or market environments. And if you've had the experience, and if not, it's never too late to start first time around to actually take the initiative and put together that transaction by not just identifying where the unique opportunity in the life cycle is or the product is, and putting together a plan of financing it. That brings me to the second point of another way to source these transactions is with existing financiers and banking relationships that might not be getting their debt coverage or investors that are not happy with the return on their investment and the business has lagged. That could be a target. Unless you're in the flip side of this is if you're already ahead of the game, like Kamal seems to be and he shared, uh, kudos to you, Kamal, where you're sitting with a war chest and you're saying, I'm not waiting, waiting for some, um, acquisition just because they're very profitable or just because they're weak. I'm looking for a very strategic, acute view of like this product is what fits into what I'm building. And so I'm not going to waste my time on filtering the noise as to what really adds value or not. So he's got a very, that's a great acumen to have and a strategy to have. The other is um, having accountants. Those are great source of uh, acquiring businesses because they're servicing people like yourself in the space. And lastly, it's obviously advisors and investment bankers. The investment bankers and advisors uh, or board members can be really good mentors and partners where with their reach, relationship network and experience, they can be a a sounding board to be able to bring transactions, to be able to bet transactions, to be able to guide the path of been there, done that, and hopefully wisdom if they've got some hair left. And so, (laughs) so, or maybe white hair, right? So, so uh, all of that hopefully makes sense on what you asked and I'm, I'm uh, answering towards. Absolutely. Uh, Jay, let's talk about content and commerce. You know, someone's asked about the next 12 months of the industry or the entire market. Uh, you know, investing in e- e-commerce or retail commerce is a big change. So you're either buying the IP, the brand, the inventory. How do you look at the market over the next 12 months? And how is it different, differentiate? And then let's talk about um, afterwards about content and the tax strategy you implemented in the past. Yeah, I think, I mean, the next 12 months, if someone's looking at, you know, like I tell everyone, like I'm all bullish on direct to consumer, you know, my portfolio personally and professionally is 80% direct to consumer brands. And I think the way you want to look at it is that, you know, everything can be replicated at the end of the day. Like, you know, if you come out with a, the next great handbag, that could be replicated in 24 hours by any other hungry person, right? So what really comes down to is that can you build a, a online brand that's interesting, that's valuable, that's um, you know compelling to the consumer, where the con- consumer trusts it and says, "This is what I want to use and trust right here." And you know we've had a lot of situations where some of our companies, when they started getting big, we had all these little players knock come out and basically copied everything in one case they actually copied the image of the founder's kid in their it was just the weirdest thing we're like come on have at least some you know you know some creativity on your own and you know but they weren't able to compete the quality of the brand and the quality of the experience so i think if you're going to build a brand or buy a brand uh, you know or a company i think you really want to look at 
do they have a great product and do they have a grand brand that people trust and want to consume? And because at the same time, that's what a big company is going to buy down the road. Exactly. Exactly. Are there industries that you would look at that you can't do yourself right now or you're looking into? Some people are asking about industries. I mean, like, I mean, health is big. I mean, health is going to be even bigger. I think online fitness has gone through the roof in terms of like home fitness and stuff like that. So anything health, fitness, food related about health and stuff like that, those are all going to be really big industries. We're seeing a lot of momentum and velocity in those types of investments where I'm seeing now on the flip side, where I'm seeing people saying, forget this is like luggage companies, right? Some, there were some luggage companies that did really well, last year and now they lost 95% of their revenue or travel networks that were, you know, starting to get a little bit of a momentum and they've gone down. Right. So now everyone's looking at the new world and saying, Hey, you know, if we can, if, if we can make people healthier, happier and make them fed better, easier through digital uh, delivery, that's going to be a big future wave. Great. Great. What about when you were at your startup and you sold out, uh, can you talk about the tax advantages of of buying, let's say, internet businesses, or at least how how you could finance them and make them cash cash flow profitable? Yeah, one of the most interesting things, and like you know, you really don't learn these things until you actually do them in person and you see the real value. So, one of the things we used to do is, you know, we'd find a business and say, okay, we like that business and we want to buy it, and we approach the founders and and it'd be a digital company, D 2 C company of some type that's ge- generating free cash flow. And what we say to them is like, look, we want to structure this acquisition, not as a stock purchase, but as an asset purchase. So we're buying the assets of the business over here. The reason we do that is that we then take that asset. So let's say hypothetically, we bought a business for $15 million and we paid them cash for it, but we say we're buying the assets. We would then go around and from an accounting standpoint, do an accelerated depreciation on that asset. So for the next three years, we're depreciating 5 million a year. Now, if that asset is generating $6 million or $5 million of annual free cash flow, which some of them were based on the model of how we bought these companies, you're basically getting free cash flow tax-free for three years because of this accelerated depreciation. And anything after that is pure gravy. So we had this model where we were doing almost $100 million worth of acquisitions into these companies where we had this great accelerated depreciation going forward that allowed us to basically have free cash flow tax-free and it really allowed us to have a very effective IRR in our acquisitions as well, too. So you have to do structuring. This is one of the examples where if you do the right structuring, you, you are disciplined in how you go about buying these companies and you're disciplined in how you like execute, you know, you can make a really good business out of this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Ike, let's get back to you and talk about the deal team building, building a, uh, an M&A team you know, from internally versus externally, the due diligence process. And then we'll talk about how to speed that up and some of the challenges involved. What, 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 why do roll-ups fail? Um, well, sure. So in my experience, we've seen a ton of great successes in roll-ups. And then there's the part where a lot of folks want to do roll-ups for perhaps the wrong reasons or perhaps not having all the resources. And that ends up in, in a situation where um, you don't necessarily find yourself prepared. Why do roll-ups fail? Probably because uh, there's a great vision, but there's not necessarily a great execution team. And what does it take to put together a good execution team? Is uh, making sure you have great retention of human capital that either it could be internal or it could be that you hire from the outside. If you're an owner operator, internal teams, if you are a builder of businesses, that I've seen has been the most successful because people are vetted, uh, vested into the transaction, not for just short-term gain, but for building a business that's going to have sustainable results, great yield, and perhaps more growth out of it. Whereas when you've got, um, and it's not, just, it's not necessarily fair to say, but we can compare it in the sense that if you're hiring an outside firm to help you with acquisitions, um, it may work for large corporations where they're positioned in such a manner or the business is such that they don't, they're not running it as a builder owner operator, but they're running it as executives and they have a lot more resources to throw at in those transactions and hire outside parties in order to strategically and tactically get a transaction done in, a, in the time frame they wanted to. Uh, because most of the large firms most likely are public. 
And there's a game where merger arbitrage starts reflecting the valuations of both companies. So you don't have the wherewithal that private acquisitions and rollups uh, don't necessarily have to deal with that exposure. So you don't have that luxury of being private and not have to deal with that. So it depends on where you are in business again, what kind of business you're running, what kind of leadership that you have that's doing this. And when it comes to having a merger acquisition team, there's a lot of uh, corporations that have their own built-in M&A teams. And uh, when you see uh, today in the market where a ton of PE firms, alternative investment firms that have different charters to invest in different verticals, they like to have what you call partner in residence kind of a uh, setup where they've got the money guys, but they're mostly folks that understand money and then they're teaming it up with folks that have product knowledge, industry knowledge, executives who have been there, done that before, might not be running money, but they are the perfect blend together to, to uh, take on these challenges and execute in that fashion. Um, having product knowledge, having business analysts, having accountant, and having legal support, those are the basic print, print, uh, elements of what you need uh, just to make sure that the uh, roll-up that you're working on is successful. Um, I think I wanted to revisit one of the things that you had asked um, Jay and in regards to where, where opportunities lie. A few years ago, we set up our own fa family office and we started pursuing transactions where we're investing in real estate and media and tech and uh, tech optimizing different setups. We found, uh, and also I sit on board of uh, the wellness and organic food industry that's done extremely well. This fund's grown tremendously. But as our backgrounds, myself and my partner, Adam Chaudhry, who introduced you and me, Vijay, he comes from banking, from Goldman and so on. Uh, finance and technology, the nexus of that has got a ton of opportunities today. And we've found a ton of, uh, not necessarily just opportunities, but growth while executing on those plans. So our family offices have invested into uh, time and money into a lot of these fintechs. One in particular, the space that has been very rewarding in this time during COVID, uh, work from home environment is cybersecurity risk and fraud. And uh, that business for us has done extremely well. There's a ton of challenges. There's a ton of innovation. There's a ton of new competition, uh, but it's very, very uh, exciting. And if, if you can stay ahead of the game, there's a ton of growth lined up for people in, in, in that sector. Excellent, excellent. So Kamal, can you mention how your team has evolved um, from focusing on building organic revenue to build your business? and then transformed into a deal team or now is like sourcing. There's really two different ways of, of managing your operations. How's that changed? Absolutely. Uh, so as we started looking at uh, acquiring more and more, we started uh, talking to our senior management team in terms of freeing up their bandwidth in terms of where their main focal point is, where their strengths are, and which part of the acquisition area can they really support. So each one of our senior management, as Ike was pointing out, you need all these multiple elements to put a deal team together from you know, acquiring deals, and once you have acquired a deal, who's going to be part of the initial due diligence process, who is going to Really, even when you look at the due diligence process, there is multiple areas you need to evaluate. You need to evaluate their front-end operations. You need to evaluate their accounting, HR, as well as their back office in order to ensure that are things running as the papers are showing. You know, um, you can always, initial phases, we hired a few accounting firms at least to help us due diligence of the numbers so that as, since they're professionals in that, it's easy for them to get in and it's more cost effective. But from, we were highly involved from the operation side to ensure the company, when you start looking under the hood, is really what uh, people or the sellers are trying to sell you. And that's, once you have the confidence in the business model in terms of their operations, the numbers will shake out the way uh, the accounting team uh, can really look at and make sense of it. Um, and that's where, you know, we continue to evolve and continue to strengthen our team behind it. And as we are making bigger deals, obviously there have been uh, bigger accounting firms which are doing uh, the initial due diligence for us, but still our core team, which we have established from HR side, 
from IT side, from operation side. And since we have multiple business units which we run, uh, depending on where the acquisition is going to roll under, we are able to take those heads of those business units and get them involved in terms of at least talking to their front end sales team, to their operations team to ensure they're going to be able to fit into the culture which we have built and the box which we have built. Excellent, excellent. Very, very good. So um, but we have a few minutes left. Um, if you have any more questions to the audience, you know, please go ahead, submit it in the q and A. I'm going to hand it off to Vishal with another question for the panelists. Uh, but submit any questions you have. If we don't get to answer them, we'll follow up uh, post the event. Uh, Vishal? Thank you, Vijar. So one of the questions which came up in the chat, and um, I want to expand that a little bit, it was in the range of EBITDA of 750K to $1.5 million. Uh, smaller, much smaller game that you guys are playing right now. But let's go back in time when you started this. Um, did you do uh, the acquisitions in that range? And what were some of the ways to raise funds for that uh, in that space? Uh, especially to talk about uh, like SBA financing is getting slower and things like that. So um, I'm asking like four or five questions in one sense, but if you can talk about your experience going back. I think I could begin real quickly with just, I mean, first, first off, if it's a good business, we do that deal now too, right? So, I mean, if you're, if you're buying a good business with good growth and EBITDA's in that range, why would you not want to have that in your portfolio? But there's a couple of ways that we've done deals in the past. One is obviously the simplest way is you just buy an all, all cash deal and you figure out what the valuation is. Uh, the other way that we've done that's a lot more creative, and this is a structure that's a lot more popular nowadays, is creating um, you know, a series LLC, for example. So you might have a holding entity that's a series LLC and you want to do a particular purchase and you know you, you might need $2 million to the purchase and you could only put in 300 of it. And you basically roll, you know, ask investors to come in for 1.7 million of it, make it a very easy closing document structure. Um, and that's been something that a lot of people are doing nowadays, especially in real estate. So a lot of people who are creating real estate, you know, you know, holdings, uh, are doing them by series LLCs and you know they just do that for ease of you know legal implementation and ease of getting a deal done so i think those are you know two interesting ways that they've been able to attract capital now obviously debt is always an option um, one of the things I'm finding interesting is that outside of the traditional banks and stuff like that, there are family offices that are interested in debt. Like there are people that want debt that is not correlated to the market, right? So for example, if I was buying a mute, like a, a, like a legal, like a, this is actually a real example. If I'm buying into an interest into an entity that serves legal law firms that are doing class action lawsuits, that's very uncorrelated to the market, right? And I want to build it, you know, buy a company that does something in that space. Um, a lot of family offices would be interested in that because they feel like it's uncorrelated. They don't mind giving the debt to that because they have an asset that they are protected with over here. So debt from different sources can be very interesting. You don't mind, I'll, I'll jump just, in uh, um, for something I think we can I'll add just, and you might agree with. Um, you know, I agree with him in regards to the size of the company. It doesn't really matter. It's a good acquisition. It could be at any price and at any price point. Um, small or big doesn't matter. The, the one thing to consider is, I think Jay mentioned earlier, when he sold one of his businesses, he was asked to stick around for the earnout. So that's another option not to forget. Uh, when you're especially starting out, you don't want to pay out all cash that you don't have. <laughs> or you're going to borrow and make someone else rich while you're trying to slave and slave pay that debt perhaps maybe a combination of raising money, as he said, and perhaps an earnout or a leverage buyout, pay as you go, when if you can structure it, uh, something to consider and keep in mind, especially when Sal pointed out, you know, when did you, when you were starting, it reminded me of that time where you don't have the money, but you want to buy something, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Come on. Just, uh... Just to add on to what Jay and I said, you know, again, it's all about creating and creative way of acquisition. So there are multiple ways you can structure a deal. Uh, some other things which we have done, especially in the human capital side where we deal with staffing, there's a huge AR component, which is always outstanding from the companies we acquire. 
So if you don't have the capital up front, we are able to structure it that we let the, the seller at least keep their AR, and that helps you reduce the cost, and you can always go back to your bank and uh, just go based on asset-based lending and uh, get some kind of a line of credit or asset-based uh, lending on that additional ARs, which you build over the next 90, 120 days. So again, it's all about creative structuring of the deals. All of these, we have done it, and whether it's you know, earn out scenario, whether it's, you know, letting go of the AR or some kind of a financing where you pay over, you know, the period of time. And, and sellers of that size organizations are pretty flexible, I would say. Okay. Kamal, Kamal, can you talk about some surprises and due diligence and how you maintain discipline when you're buying a business, you know, not overpaying for an asset or a stock? Yeah, there are multiple things which can uh, come through in a diligence. You know, we, we have the simplest thing which a lot of people don't disclose in the initial diligence is lawsuits uh, that they are privy to or things which are hanging on their feet. Uh, we did a deal of a company in California and uh, which had a lawsuit pending from them, but it became a class action lawsuit for another similar size company in uh and that became a deal breaker for us. So we had to structure the deal in such a manner where unless the lawsuit was resolved, we were holding substantial amount of funds in escrow. And we made sure that, that the sellers were able to at least lay that off and uh, only get access to the funds once it's done because some of those things uh, can really break the whole organization. And uh, that's, that's things that on the accounting side, we have seen multiple things where especially when you in the initial phases when we were dealing with small companies most of the time they don't have uh, large accounting firms managing their funds and it's the accounting is primarily done by the business owner so you would not have a clear picture of what exactly their in their gross profits are what their EBITDAs are and it's more driven by you know everything runs through the company so it becomes a big uh, due diligence issues when you deal with those kind of organizations. And I'm sure we have all come across uh, these kind of companies. Excellent, excellent. So uh, um, if there are any other questions, um, let's see, I don't see anything else right now. Uh, Vishal, if you have anything else. Um, no, there are no other questions. Um, so uh, we would like to wrap it up by uh, thanking the panelists. Uh, Vijar, anything else to add before I uh, do the typical? Uh, Adam, Adam just asked one question about the investment horizon. How has it changed? Uh, maybe I, you could take this, you know, do you have, do investors have a longer term view? Um, how, how are valuations changing across the board? Wow. Of course, leave it to Adam to put, put me up to, to, to working, right? Challenge. Um, <laughs> well, it depends what, again, which industry you're in. So what we're finding in our FinTech space, uh, the horizon is, um, you know, much sooner than later. The investors are no longer just typical Silicon Valley investors. It has become a blend of investment arms of large organizations that are actually your client, your partner, and your reseller, and your investor. There are good examples of that in the market today. When you look at fintech companies and payment space, they might be coming out of Silicon Valley in the sector we're in. They've got a client like Bank of America. The Bank of America is using them in all different sectors. And then Bank of America is interested in partnering with them to provide better service in the market because there is that void. And the large companies are not moving fast enough to come up with innovation to deliver upon their legacy system issues or disjointed opportunities that can be facilitated right away. And they see value in partnering up with young startups, the unicorns that we see every, every week being popping out, where it allows them to leapfrog rather than deal with uh, stale and uh, tired and fatigued internal processes and disjointed systems. And so with that said, it answers the question in a way that you've got this new breed of investor that's your client, your endorser, your partner, your investor, and at the same time looking to take you public and take you and do an M&A for you. So that's a huge uh, differentiator that recently has evolved in the market as a investor of that kind. The horizon for them is of all different 
uh, time zones. It's immediate, it's short term, and it's long term. And then there's the typical investors that are basically, depending on what kind of charter they had on the funds that they've raised, they're looking at investments of, like Kamal pointed out earlier, they're, they're looking at companies, depending on what sector you're in again, in again $10 million minimum checks, $15 million minimum checks, uh, some like minority ownership, some like majority control ownership, some want to change the way you're operating, some want to just let you run the way you're running and bet on the idea you've got and facilitate. And we've been in that business many times ourselves uh, from investment standpoint and then figuring out owner, stand, owner operator positioning. And those guys, that, those investment funds might have five year life cycle, might have seven year life cycle. And if they don't see result out of it, they like to exit out of it to get that money back and pass it to someone else. That could be a strategic buyer again. People like us again, owner operators and entrepreneurs. So the, that's basically the payment side. And then there's other industries where if you take media, we're also invested in film and Hollywood. And if you look at that space today, it's, it's hurting. It's not necessarily, uh, it's, it doesn't have any legs. No one's shooting any movies. No one's making any new content. You're dealing with uh, Netflix basically repeating the broadcast from the past or recent acquisitions that they're making. But what happens in that industry? The investment horizon has suddenly gone on to a, a zone of its own that's going to be revisited when everybody comes out of the pandemic. What's happening to the valuations for companies and businesses of that sort? They've dropped quite a bit. They're hemorrhaging. Retail real estate, same thing. Uh, E-commerce has taken off, but what about their uh, counterpart? Uh, people are paying rent for not being able to open a shop. So it depends on what in industry you're in. And the investment horizon depends on uh, some of these market dynamics that we're talking about today. Hopefully gives some color to, um, I'll, I'll get a grade from my partner later if I answer this question right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was excellent. Um, I'll wrap up with the last question to Jay. Nikita just asked about how do you value e-commerce businesses? You know, they're asset light. Um, they're mostly inventory. There's a lot of IP. How do you do those type of deals? How do you value them? And then someone asked about the series LLC. Maybe you can quickly just talk about what's the difference between a series LLC versus a corp and how that, how that works. Sure. Um, in valuation, I mean, in the very, very early stages when a company is just a PowerPoint deck, it's very much like, you know, the quality of the founder, the background of the founder, the space that they're going after. So it's a little bit harder to value it then. But once they're launched and they're running, you know, what the two numbers that we always care about is like, what's your current, you know, uh, run rate? Like, are you doing a million dollars a year run rate? And then what's your growth rate, right? So you kind of like say like, hey, you might have like only a run rate of a half a million dollars a year, but your growth rate is 50% month over month. I'm going to overpay for that business than a business that's doing a million dollar run rate, but growing only 10% month over month, right? So I think the combination of run rate plus, um, um, you know, growth rate are critical over here, but also sector matters. So if you're in a, like, for example, the pet sector, uh, when a pet company is acquired, it gets acquired for usually 8x multiples, right? So like, if you have a hot pet company, I'm willing to pay more for that because I know that the acquirer, Mars or someone down the road, or General Mills is gonna pay a lot of money for that over there. So the sector matters as well too. So sector growth rate and you know run rate are the three metrics over there. And then your question was on the series structure, right? Yeah. yeah. So on that one, the way to think about it is like, you know, if I were to right now buy real estate, if I were to buy like property, then you know, if I were to buy three different houses, I usually would, in the traditional world, I'd set up as three different LLCs if I'm doing this for business purposes. Why? because it, it confines the liability of that business. If I have three different investors in the three different houses, it allows for each investor to have siloed interest uh, that's legally just there and not you know, commingled with other ones. The series LLC really came about originally because of real estate and they're like, why am, you know, if I'm a big real estate investor, I literally have to create 40 or 50 LLCs and do all this tax work. The IRS understood that, Delaware understood that, and so they're creating, hey, you can create an LLC that's defined as a series LLC and you can have up to 200 series in that LLC and each series by law will be protected as an individual asset of itself and you can apply for individual loans for that series as long as you, you know, do certain things like have, uh, you know, a, a separate bank account for that. You could potentially have your own EIN, but the IRS eats that regulation nothing. You don't have to have a separate EIN. If you want to keep everything under one EIN, that's fine. Now, the real advantage of the series has become to investors and venture funds and especially 
uh, special purpose vehicles or, you know, SPVs as we call them, where people are like, hey, I'm going to create a series LLC and I plan to do 10 deals in five years. Uh, so two deals a year where I'm going to bring in friends who are going to put in half a million into each deal and buy a bar here, a restaurant here, a digital e-commerce business there. And, you know, whatever it is, I'm just giving you like a long example. But then those people can come into what they want and they can invest in a particular series knowing that they're protected for that particular series over there. And for me, it makes the administration a lot easier from a tax standpoint, from a legal standpoint, and also from a standpoint of pure simplicity over here. So it's actually, a, it's actually something that's very popular. A lot of foreign law firms are really doing a lot of LLC work nowadays, series LLC work, because it is a structure that gained a lot of popularity. Excellent, excellent. So thank you, panelists. I'm just gonna wrap it up. You know, we talked about how to raise capital from private equity or organic growth. Um, operational challenges in the world of roll-ups, uh, what problems you'll face uh, sourcing deals, working on due diligence. Uh, when I look at, ro at roll-up acquisitions, I focus on three different tenets, uh, creating a long-term vision, uh, having an efficient tax structure, and creating culture. So creating that deal team, creating your operating team are, are critical. So thank you to the panelists, Jay, Kamal, and Ike. This was very helpful. Uh, Vishal will wrap it up and discuss what else the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce has in store for 2020. Thank you, Vijar. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, I really appreciate Kamal, Ike, Jay. Uh, I want to just talk quickly for one minute about Punjabi Chamber. Uh, this, when we do events like this, I'm going to share this page. When we do events like this, it just boggles my mind that we have a resource like this, which Gary and the team put together. And we're so proud of the community we have built. And no wonder we are growing this fast. What is the reason we are able to bring people like Ike, Kamal, or Jay, um, and thanks Vijar for doing this. We have people who are building hotels. We have CPAs. We have... Uh, lawyers in the group, we have youngsters who are going to college, who are starting their first job. So the, the network here is something that you can tap on to, uh, if you're looking to learn, if you're looking to grow, or if you're looking to give back. So people like Ike, Jay, um, and then Gary and Kamal who are giving back to community. So we want to, uh, uh, my message is, a broad message to everyone. If you're looking for something uh, and you're looking to grow, come join Punjabi Chamber. If you're looking to give back, come join Punjabi Chamber. It's free. It is free right now. It, is always, it will always be free. We have chapters across all the globe. We have chapters in India. We have chapters in Canada. And we're, uh, we're starting chapters in UK, Australia, and all over the, the globe. And soon, we will we'll be able to say we are in more than 20, 30, 40, 100 countries. So I request, I encourage you guys to join Punjabi Chamber and uh, we'll, look, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you as part of the uh, next event. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bale, bale. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> thank you, Dean. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.